fluxes. He wants to be a judge. He wants to be um, a surgeon. And then he wants to be my youth pastor. So I'm trying to ease him uh, to the youth pastor side because we've got enough judges in the world. Let's get another youth pastor <laughs> preaching the gospel. That's what I think. And it's his, and it's his birthday today. 16 years old. So isn't that cool? 16. And he's single. Um, <laughs> we're taking applications now. Um, if you feel inclined, you could write to Samuel on his social media. He's got a little Facebook account. He's very proud of it. But I thought, wouldn't it be cool if he woke up this morning in, in Australia and he had happy birthday from the rock, from all the rock people. And uh, his hashtag is at, which is that little thing, Samuel Kubala. And if you felt inclined to write to him and say, hey, your dad's a legend, that would make me feel very, very good. Come on, somebody. Isn't that God good? Hey, I just want to mention very quickly, we've got um, our USBs, which is, um, uh, got, uh, I think, uh, 13 messages on here, uh, which talks about the miraculous power of God. It's called Be Healed. And there's one thing to uh, know about healing, but there's one thing to experience it. Keep it and maintain it. Lots of people say to me, Andrew, I want to be healed. I want to be healed of this. I want to be healed. I want my life to change. But they refuse to read the Bible, you know, which is, which is confusing to me because the Bible says that we are transformed by the renewing of our mind. You see, sometimes God wants you to be involved in the miracle. So we have, uh, we've had over 50 conferences um, now around the world, and uh, which I have run, and out of those, I've picked like the top 14 messages or so, and I've put them on this USB so that you would know how to keep, receive, and maintain your miracle. Because there's one thing about having a miracle, but there's also keeping it and maintaining it. Every day I wake up and I say, God, thank you for my healing. And I've been doing that for 25 years. I'm getting older. Uh, and, and I really believe this is going to help you. There's only a few left. Um, and then uh, this other message, is, which is uh, my message uh, called Andrew and Janine's New Collection, uh, talks about my story, how I was healed of leukemia. Uh, four times I was diagnosed to be terminal. I made a decision for Christ uh, when I was 13 to 18 years old. When I was 15, I gave my life to Christ, brought up in a Catholic church, all my life, but a pretty girl asked me to go to a youth group, and I said yes, <clears throat> and I'm um, still a sucker for blondes, and there we go, God got me saved. But soon after that, about two years after, I was diagnosed to be terminal. My mum and dad brought the Catholic priest to prepare me for burial. Who knows, that's a bad day. <laughs> mm, that's a bit awkward, isn't it? But then soon after that, um, these youth pastors from this Presbyterian church brought in their big Bible, smiling. I remember like yesterday. And they said, we believe in a different report. We believe that God can heal you. And I remember looking at them in my 11th hour, really so, so sick. You could have seen every rib on my body. I was so lean and so thin. And I didn't really have a lot of faith, I guess, but the very fact that I allowed them to pray for me, I think was enough of a, of a whiff of faith, a sniff of faith. God says, I'll take that. And because of their prayers, soon after that, the very next blood test, the doctor said that I was out of the woods, that I wasn't going to die. And um, I had to fight. I had to fight for my miracle. Maybe you're in a fight today. I'm believing that these USBs are going to help you. Janine's message is unbelievable. And uh, I lived in different countries when I first met her. I lived in New Zealand. Janine lived in Australia. The truth is that when we got married, we'd only spent 12 days together before we got married. So, because um, lots of phone calls and lots of Skype meetings and, and stuff like that. When the minister said, will you take Janine Marie? I went, Marie? I didn't even know her name. Uh, like, <laughs> I just married her for her legs, basically. Hello. <laughs> Awkward. Okay. But the Bible does say it's better to marry than to burn with passion. And um, it was getting hot. So I thought, 12 days, that's enough. Let's get it done. But 20 years later, we're celebrating. So that's good, isn't it? <laughs> Found out that Janine was sexually abused at the age of eight. 
and um, had anorexia, bulimia, was living with drug lords in South America. When I was hearing that for the first time in front of a thousand young people in, in our youth ministry, I thought, is there refunds? I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> joking. Is this, is this going around the world? Whoops. Uh, can, we, can we rewind that? No. And, um, but Janine has a dream where she meets the devil, and the devil is talking to her in the dream. And the devil says to Janine, you're not living for me, and you're not living for God. And friend, a lot of people are like that, actually. It's not like they're committing adultery or murdering people. They're just not really on fire for God. And the devil said to Janine, if you give your life to me, you'll be successful in all your endeavors. She was going to be the ambassador for Australia and Indonesia and um, your children will be successful, and I'm even happy for you to keep your eating disorders. And then she says, all right, I choose you, devil. As soon as she does that, from the top of her head to the soles of her feet, she becomes stone cold, wakes up screaming, Jesus, save me. On the other side of the world, her mum rings her and says she had a scripture saying the devil had come to sift her as wheat. We've been praying for her all night. And Janine has this amazing born-again experience. Two years later, the greatest miracle happens. She meets me. And then from then on, her life is blessed. And, um, but I'm taken, so I can't fix that other part for you. But Janine talks on her USB about seven things that she can do to receive her miracle. One was to read the Bible morning and night. Oftentimes, we want the lightning bolt, God. I'm going to talk about this a little bit tonight how we all want the miracle, but we want it straight away. But sometimes God requires us to do something for the miracle, big or small. Whether you have to dip yourself in the river or show yourself to a priest, come forward to be prayed for, or whatever it is. But sometimes you have to be involved in the miracle. Janine had anorexia, bulimia. She hadn't eaten meat for seven years when she married me. And God spoke to her and said, if you want to be healed, you have to eat meat. He's a good, good father. Yes, you are. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because how good would, to eat meat? I'm a carnivore. Hello, somebody. I like meat. And so I'm like, oh, how can I have a wife who doesn't eat meat? I'm going to starve. I'm going to die. And so God, God said that. But friend, you know what? I was there when she went to the grocery store and um, brought, brought the steak, put it on the pan, cut a little slither. I was there when she put it into her mouth, feeling sick. Just the smell of it. But friend, how much do you want your miracle? How desperate, what are you prepared to do for your miracle? And I haven't even started preaching yet, but listen to me. Some of you have already decided you're not coming tonight. You need to change that decision. What are you prepared to do for your miracle? Just to, just to flip something around and say, you know what, I'm, I'm coming back into the house of God for a miracle to take place in your life. In Jesus' name. Come on, give God a clap and thank Him. I want to talk to you on the subject of interrupting heaven. Come with me and I'm talking about blind Bartimaeus. Mark 10, verse 46. Interrupting heaven. This is the title. Who wants to interrupt heaven today? Anybody? Come on. Then they came to Jericho and Jesus and His disciples together with a large crowd were leaving the city and a blind man... Bartimaeus, that is the son of Timaeus, he didn't even have his own name, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted even more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called to the blind man, Cheer up on your feet. He is calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he leapt to his feet. And came to Jesus, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. That must be the question of the morning. It must be the question that God would ask us today. What do you really want from me? Is there something inside of you that is desperate on the the front of your mind? The blind man said, I want to see, even though it would seem obvious. Jesus said, go. Everybody say, "Your your faith. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. I love this because we must remember to never let the crowd determine your destination. You see, in in Mark 10, verse 46, it says, A large crowd was gathered around, 
In the Bible, there are crowds mentioned many, many times in lots of circumstances. We remember one where a young lady who was bleeding for 12 years comes up and pushes through the crowd. She didn't belong there. She shouldn't have been there. But she said in her heart, I need a miracle today. I'm going to touch him. And because of her touch on a garment, she was healed. Here is a crowd shouting at a man saying, sit down, lower your voice. It's embarrassing what's happening. But we must remember that a crowd is not just people around us. In fact, we can have a crowd, an invisible crowd in our mind. Who knows what I'm talking about? A crowd, a thousand voices telling you not to do it, not to stretch, not to, to, to believe again. A crowd trying to limit you. A crowd that is, that is saying it's impossible for God to do it. But we must not let the crowd determine your destination. That's why reading the Bible is so important. That's why a crowd of believers encouraging us, a crowd like the Rock Church encouraging us, can, can counteract other voices in our head. We must remember that the crowd has no regard for your well-being. The crowd will never visit you. The crowd never prays for you. The crowd passes you by. The crowd never has faith, is never full of faith, and the crowd is fickle. One minute the crowd is shouting, Hallelujah! And putting palms on the road as Jesus walks by, only a few moments later to yell out, Crucify Him. The crowd. There has to be something inside of you. Come on, friend. There has to be something inside of you that is determined enough to say, this is the day that the Lord has made. And I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. What's inside of you? Don't let other voices determine your location. I love that your shout has the ability to interrupt heaven. I mean, I like this guy. I like him a lot. That like there's a whole bunch of people around and he heard that Jesus is walking by. Man, what a day. Why would he begin to shout? Oh, I think in the old days, around the biggest tents, there must have been times when they're warming their hands, telling the stories of the miraculous. Now, friends, for the first time in the history of the world, lepers can be healed. Could you imagine that? Never ever before could change happen. But now a person called Jesus Christ through the power of God heals lepers. Blind people see. Imagine they heard the rumour of a man dead for three days. Shut the gate. Three days. And Jesus calls him by name, Lazarus. <laughs> Get me out. And this guy, man, can you imagine this guy wambling out, like walking out? And he's got all his grave clothes. I can't even see. He's still got the thing on his head. Like, come out like, a, like some kind of horror movie. <laughs> the rumors that now nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible now. And he begins to shout. And it stops the Lord in his, in his place. Jesus was going on to do something else. Going on to do a, a miracle for somebody else. But right there, somebody arrested heaven's attention. The devil always shouts back, doesn't he? Many rebuked him. I said, be quiet. Shut up. Leave him alone. I'm telling you, I don't know how Walt Disney did it. But when he created that person called Donald Duck, and I like mentioning that guy, especially in America, because you know exactly what I'm talking about when I say the angel duck appeared on one side and the devil duck appears on the other side. Every time poor old Donald's about to do something good or bad, boom, there's the, there's the ducks. And I don't know how Walt Disney did it, but he articulated spiritual warfare perfectly. Because those voices are as real as you can imagine. I can tell you right now, 
The devil does not want your marriage to be successful today. He does not want your children to be blessed. He does not want you to be healed. He does not want you to be authentic in your Christianity and your walk. He does not want you to become a Christian today. He wants you to remain broken, beaten up and depressed. He will shout at you. He will whisper to you. Some of you don't even know that the devil's even talking to you yet because you are so comfortable around that arena. But but I'm telling you, when you start to realize exactly who you're tuning into, you can get pretty angry about it, pretty indignant about it. I remember uh, just recently I was in Africa and we were seeing amazing miracles happen. And over a thousand people came to Christ in, in, the, in this one Sunday. I had preached five times in a row, so my throat was a little bit ho hoarse. And I was feeling a bit tired. I felt like I had prayed for everybody and we had kind of just left the meeting and um, walked down the stairs. The, the minister, pastor, was about to do the love offering. And as I walked down, I saw a, a young lady and she was in a wheelchair. And I thought to myself, I'm not sure if I had prayed for her. So I was trying to be very sensitive and come down and whisper to her and say, is there ever, everything okay? And she said, I haven't walked past her for 21 years. I said, well, that's no good. Well, let's, let's begin to pray for her. And as I began to pray for her, instantly I can hear the devil talk to me and say, Andrew, this is embarrassing. This will never work. It's funny how I can hear God's voice, but I can hear the devil's voice come and talk to me. Who knows what I'm talking about? It, it, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing because some people think that I'm so spiritual sometimes because I'm praying for people on stage and uh, the, and and. And I, and I say in the name of Jesus, get off in the name of Jesus to them. And, I t and I'm telling the devil to get off. And, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but what I'm actually saying is I'm telling the devil to get off me. Because I can hear the devil talking to me. And I'm, I'm in mid-prayer, you know what I mean? And I have to say, in the name of Jesus, get off. And you're all thinking, wow. No, I've got demons talking to me. I've got the devil saying, Andrew, this is not going to work. This, 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 this person is 21 years in a wheelchair. Why would you think that she's going to walk out of that wheelchair? That's what he says to me. Why would you think? I said, well, you know why? Because I lift up my eyes to the Lord. Because this is where my help comes from. It comes from the maker of heaven and earth. And if he made the heaven and the earth, then he can do that as well. Come on, somebody, give God a big shout. The amazing thing is, here she is 21 years after we prayed for her, she begins to walk. The, amazing, the exciting thing for me was the person who had looked after her for three years, her carer, was a Muslim lady. And she had bathed her, she had looked after her, she had pushed her around the super, who know, you know, like for three years, her cure. And she said, I heard that Jesus could heal. I heard that your God was real. But now I believe and became a Christian. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Isn't he good? <laughs> what if the worship team could join me? You have to take a leap. To meet your miracle, often you have to take a leap. Jesus stopped and said, Call him, so they called him. On your feet, get up. Throwing his cloak aside. <laughs> Friends, we forget that these stories are real. You know what I mean? Like, we just kind of forget that this actually happened. Can you imagine for a minute? This, this person, he's blind. He heard a rumor that Jesus could heal. But now he's passing by. <laughs> he's passing by. He begins to shout, Son of David, have mercy on me. And they re rebuke him, sit down, shut up. But he doesn't, he gives another, another barrage. <laughs> Son of David, have mercy on me. I said, Call. He's calling you. He said, throwing his cloak aside. This cloak, this, this is a big deal. This jacket, this jacket was everything to him, he, he was paid because of this jacket. It was an official jacket given to him by the government 
a beggar's garment so that he could receive income <laughs> legitimately. And now he's throwing it away blind. It may never, ever come back to him. It's never coming back. So what happens? Jesus says, your faith has healed you. Wow. Could you imagine that? Like, wow. My, my, I can see. I can see now. Could you imagine three days later? Maybe a week later. Now he can see the miracle. Pastor Dan, this, this isn't in the Bible, so don't, don't tweet about it. But, but come with me. Because maybe it's a picture of us when we've been healed or saved. And he looks, goes to the place where he was saved again. Remember? Because he just wanted to worship God in the place he was healed. But he sees the jacket. <laughs> didn't think he would see it. He didn't, he's like, wow, the jacket. Picks it up. Oh, smells the same. It smells the same. Doesn't our past have a familiarity about it? Oh man, I've been, I've been saved three years. I've been married 20 years, but maybe I'll just have a little look on Facebook at that old girlfriend. I'll just try on my past a little bit. I've been saved for a while, but I remember that feeling of getting drunk. Maybe I'll just have a few drinks. Nobody will know. With my Christian friends, I'm a Christian. But with my non-Christian friends, I'm a non-Christian. Half in, half out. Watching pornography, half in, half out. Just trying it on a little bit. Just half in, half out. Trying on the past again. The Bible says because you're neither hot nor cold, but because you're lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. You can play whenever you want, my friend. Because you're hot or cold, I'm going to spit you out. God says, you know, which is kind of strange, I'd rather you're all in. Either be a real good sinner or a real good Christian. But make up your mind. I wonder if God's talking to somebody today. Maybe God has touched your life in the past. But you're just half in, half out. I think the question that we ask ourselves, well, I ask myself every now and then is, when were you on, when's the last time you're honest with God? Do you know what I mean? Like when were you honest? When's the last time you were just honest? You and God. I mean, if we believe that He's real, why won't we be honest with Him? You know, I was on uh, national radio in our a, in a, in a country and the, the, the person uh, interviewing me was kind of trying to trick me a little bit. He said to me, he said, uh, Pastor Andrew, how do people receive their healing? How do they receive their miracle? And I said, well, you know, I, I feel like I'm kind of still new. <laughs> still new to this game, but I believe that all the evangelists that I've talked to, so there are three things that are common in a miracle. The number one is that you're a Christian. You may think, well, you know, the Bible talks about people who aren't Christians getting healed, and that's true. And I've seen many, many, many people who aren't following the Lord yet, receive a miracle. But what we're trying to say is sometimes I just feel like it goes easier, easier for those who know, know the Lord. There just seems to be a more receptivity to that. In fact, the Bible says it like this. If you're sick, come to church. If you've done something wrong, confess it. And then the elders, the man and woman of God will pray for you. And the prayer of faith will heal you. Why do more miracles happen in church than outside of church? It's because when you're praying for people in church, 
there's like a thousand people stretching out their hand, praying with you. And I believe that every prayer counts. Every hand lifted matters to God. Second of all, the removal of sin. We know that sin separates us from God. The Bible says that His mercy for for us is available every morning. The third is that we will change our confession. The Bible teaches us that there is power of life and death and what? Our words. And so what we talk about and what we think about locates you. What you're saying and what you're thinking about your life is exactly where you're heading. And the only really way to change it is to resource yourself, to to read the Bible, and so that things begin to change and your belief system changes. And that's why tonight is so very important that we come and learn some skills on how to receive a miracle. But right here, right now, I know that God is setting us up for an amazing moment as we just reflect about our lives. So why don't we just do this? In a moment, why don't you just close your eyes? In fact, we can do that right now. Just to close your eyes and to ask that question to your soul. Am I in relationship with God? I think that's an honest prayer, don't you? Am I in relationship with God? Not am I a good person? Not do I help the elderly across the road? But actually, am I connected to God? I'm not talking about you missed your quiet time last night. I'm talking when you look inside your soul, you're lost. And you need God to do something in your life. In a moment, as you ponder that thought, I'm going to pray for you. At the end of that prayer, if you want to rededicate your life to the Lord, or perhaps for the first time, ask Jesus to come into your life, just where you sit it, I'm going to ask you to shoot up your hand. I'll see that hand, and then I'll ask you to put it down. I would like to pray for you personally, if I could, because I think it would be amiss to skip past this like it didn't really matter, because I know it's got an internal weight behind it, and it does very much matter. So let me pray for you. God, I I do thank you for those people who are here for the first time, second time, maybe visiting from another church or maybe watching online today, and they're saying, Andrew, it's true. I know about God, but if I'm honest, I'm not in relationship with you. Something has to turn for me. I was up very early this morning, 3 a.m., praying for the service. And I really felt like God said to me, there are numerous people here who are saying, Andrew, I cannot have another year like last year. The last 12 months have been a train wreck train wreck and you know that the gap is God that God just wasn't in that picture but I'm believing that from this moment on your 2018 and beyond is going to be your best years yet or maybe you're here you're saying Andrew it is sin that's separating me from God a wrong relationship perhaps a secret sin that nobody else would know about. But friend, we know today that God sees everything. Or maybe you're here and you're saying, Andrew, if I was to face death like you had to as a teenager, if I was to walk out of this room and get hit by a car, stand before God, Pastor, I don't know if I'd be in heaven or hell. There'd be a fear and uncertainty around that moment. But would you pray with me So I can have a relationship with God, walk in that relationship and have an assurance of my salvation. Come on, friend. If you're in one of those categories, why don't you just shoot up your hand just right now. I'll see it and ask you to put it down in just a moment. Thank you, thank you. Who else? You're saying, Andrew, that's me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Who else today? You're saying, Andrew, something has to turn. Something has to shift for me. Thank you. Who else today? You're saying, Andrew, that's me. Thank you, thank you. Who else? You're saying, Andrew, something has to turn. Something has to shift. Thank you, thank you, thank you. A miracle for me. Maybe you're sitting there thinking, should I, shouldn't I? (laughs) Friend, how do you think the devil's going to come? How do you think he's going to come? Do you really think he's going to stand before you in a red suit holding some kind of pitchfork like a Walt Disney character? No, he's going to whisper to you. He's going to appeal to your pride and say, don't you do it. Sir, don't you do it. But don't you listen to Him today. 
Let me fight for your miracle today. Fight for your family, friend. Fight for your kids. Fight for your grandchildren. Fight for your soul today. Lift up your eyes to the Lord. Give Him this window of opportunity and let a miracle come into your life. Friend, if you need to lift, now is the time to do it. Come on, one more time. Cross, I'm looking, I'm looking. Thank you, more hands now. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, who else did I? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, so many more hands. I appreciate it, thank you. You've got to be honest with God somewhere in your world.